name's Greg Weissman. Uh, I am uh, the creator of Gargoyles, uh, producer of shows like Spectacular Spider-Man, uh, Young Justice. Uh, I was ex one of the executive producers of the first season of Star Wars Rebels. Um, and uh, I've written a couple books, Reign of the Ghosts and Spirits of Ash and Foam, both of which are on sale at this convention. Uh, and uh, this is a Q&A, so I'm hoping you guys have cues. Great. Yeah, right here. I haven't even read those rumors. So, uh, you're breaking my heart, man. <laughs> you think you want to do it? Yeah, back there. How did I do it? Uh, I took a somewhat unusual route. Uh, I started in comic books um, when I was 19, working for DC. Um, when I graduated college, I got a job at on staff at DC Comics as a sort of junior, uh, they called it a, a editorial assistant, which is a nice fancy title for Xerox boy, basically. Um, but worked my way up to associate editor and then uh, left to come back to Los Angeles, that's where I'm from, uh, and I went to graduate school at USC, uh, got my master's degree in uh, professional writing, and um, when I graduated from SC, I uh, got a job as uh, what in those days they called a uh, staff assistant. Nowadays, we'd call it a development associate or something like that. It was basically a very, very junior executive at Walt Disney Television Animation. And um, my plan at the time was that this would just be my day job, and I would go home every night and write, and that never happened. I mean, the job was pretty all-encompassing. Um, I worked my way up to uh, director of series development, and then I developed a series called Gargoyles. Uh, created and developed that show, um, which was great, and uh, I just sort of really fell in love with that show, and so I went to my bosses and said, look, I want to produce this show, and they were like, well, you've never produced a show before, we're not sure about this, and I'm like, well, yeah, but I was never a development executive before, and that worked out all right, um, and so to make a long story short, they said yes, um, so Frank Parr and I produced the first season of Gargoyles while I simultaneously continued to do my full-time development job. Um, and we did 13 episodes, and then the second season, they ordered 52 episodes, and there was no way I could do both jobs simultaneously with 52, so I moved over full-time to become a producer. Um, then I, uh, so my route was a little unusual. In other words, I, I didn't start out as a writer, I actually started out as a producer, and then, uh, then started writing, uh, I mean, I, I considered myself a writer the whole time, I did a lot of editing, a lot of rewriting, but I never wrote a single episode of Gargoyles uh, until the third season, and then I left the show uh, before the beginning of the third season, and uh, after writing one episode, um, and uh, they did a version of Gargoyles called the Goliath Chronicles that we pretend never existed. Uh, right, so uh, then I just became a, uh, I went to DreamWorks for a couple of years and then uh, became a freelance writer, producer, voice director, occasional voice actor, um, and uh, that's the route I took. And since then I've written a ton of stuff, but I actually sort of went in reverse. Usually people work their way up from writer to story editor to producer, and I sort of started a producer and went the other direction, which is weird, but that's how it was for me. Yeah. I hope so, but I haven't heard anything. I, you know, I, 
I've constantly asked Disney about that through multiple different regimes, and so far there's been no interest. Yeah, right here. Did you have a question? Well, I'd always been fascinated by gargoyles since uh, I, I went to Europe uh, on one of those high school trips where you go to like eight countries in five weeks kind of trips. Um, uh, and I just thought gargoyles were sort of interesting. And the whole legend behind gargoyles, which is very brief, it's just sort of like you put these statues on the, you know, on the battlements of your building to scare away evil spirits. And I thought, well, that's odd. I mean, you've got these sort of scary monsters, and their job is to scare away scary things. You know, it's like, why wouldn't they cooperate? So it just sort of fascinated. That idea seems so counterintuitive. So I tried to think as to why people would think that would work. So the idea that came to me and, and really my team, because there were a team of people who worked together on the show, was, uh, okay, if you extrapolate backwards, Maybe it's because once upon a time there were these creatures that protected the castle. And they turned to stone during the day, but at night they woke up and, and came to life. So I thought, you know, if they were gone, but the legend lived on, people would put those stone statues on because then someone attacking wouldn't know during the day, are they real or, or, or not, and they'd be afraid to attack. Um, but we had other inspirations as well. I mean, a huge inspiration for the show was Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. Um, and when we started developing the series, it was very... It, first off, the series was a comedy. It was a comedy adventure show, very much in the mold of Gummy Bears. But instead of doing cute little bouncy bears, we did cute little multicolored gargoyles They were that woke up. And all the backstory was there, but it was a comedy, and we just couldn't sell that show. So we went back to the drawing board a couple times until finally our boss, his boss, his boss, Michael Eisner, who at the time ran the Walt Disney Company, finally said yes and uh, let us make the show that you guys all saw. Yeah, over there. I think he had done one, yeah, first major role, yeah. Uh, well, the thing to keep in mind is for regular characters, we audition, we hold auditions, because the bosses, all the powers that be, they want approval on everyone, and they want choices. So you have to get, you know, you audition hun literally hundreds of actors in order to narrow it down to two or three choices for each role, and then you have your pick, which you can argue for, but you've got to play these choices for all the bosses. So first off, the first thing you learn is, you know, I, I knew a guy once who uh, wanted someone so badly that the choices he gave were, he gave like the second choice he thought was, well, this one's so awful, there's no way they won't go with the guy I wanted. So, of course, the boss is picked, um, the, the, you know, the awful, awful guy, and he was, uh, had to sort of, he didn't actually, he wasn't actually stuck with that person, but he had to sort of stop and just sort of say, ah, oh, that was, you know, he had to cop to what he had done. He got in big trouble. But, um, so you have to only choose people that you could live with. Um, but what happened for us on uh, Gargoyle specifically is, you know, we were holding auditions for about 10 characters. Um, and, you know, it's not like we did all the Goliaths first and then all the Brooklyns. It was like, you know, actors were coming in and they'd read for whichever characters they thought they might be good for. So, for example, literally the very first person who came in to read for us, period, um, was Maria Sirtis, who played Deanna Troy on uh, Next Generation. Um, and she read for Elisa. We didn't think she was right for Elisa, but we thought she might be great for Demona, but we didn't actually have the audition side ready for Demona yet. So we asked, had to ask her to come back. And she came back, and she was the first person to read for Demona, and we knew she was great, but of course we had to listen to a bunch of other people. But she obviously won the role, um, which was really our only choice for it. Uh, 
then Jonathan Frakes, a little later, came in and auditioned for Goliath and Xanatos. Um, but he was great for Xanatos. Uh, had a couple other guys we also thought were great for Xanatos, but ultimately Jonathan got the part. Um, and so at that point, we had two next generation actors in our cast. And so, you know, after casting the regulars through the audition process, you don't then hold auditions for other characters. There's just no time. So what you're talking about is me and Frank Parr, who we were the two producers, and Jamie Thomason, who was our casting and voice director. We'd be in the booth for an episode, and Jamie would say to us, okay, what do I need for next week? And I would be like, you know, just as an example, I'd be like, uh, well, next week we've got Goliath's brother on the show, so we need some guy with really deep chops, you know, like Keith David has, to play Goliath's brother. And we'd be trying to think of who that could be. And you'd look out and see Marina and Jonathan through the glass. And you'd go, and I was like, well, what about Michael Dorn? You know, in other words, and it really was like that at first. It was just like, you know, we had a couple Star Trek actors there. And then, um, so just sort of put those actors in your head. And so we wound up casting Brent Spiner as Puck and, and, um, of our burden as a Nancy, etc., um, and then we cast uh, Nichelle Nichols, played Uhura on the regu- on the original Star Trek. We cast her as Elise's mother, Diane Mazza, and at that point, I think just it became like, well, can we get someone from every Star Trek show? So we got Kate Mulgrew as as Titania, and we got uh, um, Comini in there, and we got. Um, uh, Cisco, I'm blanking out his name, uh, uh, Avery Brooks. And so, you know, we just kept doing that. And, and look, at some point we realized there was a publicity value to this. Now, I would never cast someone to the detriment of the show. But, hey, if I can get a little publicity out of it, I'm, I'm, that's good for the show, so why not? Um, uh, so it, it was both uh, initially what it really was about was Marina and Jonathan kicking ass in their auditions and winning those parts. Then it was about they were there, so they put actors in our mind. Then it became kind of a game, and then it became a publicity thing. And it, but it, all those things worked together. So that's how we wound up with all the Star Trek actors. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't really talk about that. So, uh, but... Uh, you know, I had a great time on the first season, and they're working on the second season. They've got great people on that. Henry Gilroy took over for me, and Henry wrote a number of episodes for season one. And uh, they still got Simon Kinberg, and especially Dave Filoni. And Dave is really the heart and soul of uh, Lucasfilm Animation. So uh, you're in good hands for season two, but no, I'm not working on season two. Um, I, the, the six leads, the crew of the ghost and the inquisitor all were there when I came aboard, Dave and Simon and Carrie Beck created those characters. I like to think I helped. I mean, for example, I gave them last names. Um, they had no last names when I came aboard. Um, and, uh, I didn't come up with all the last names, although, uh, it was definitely my idea to give them last names. Uh, and, uh. I came up with some of them. I came up with uh, Aurelios for Zeb, and I also came up with the curse word Carabast. That was me. Um, then there were characters that we created after that, like Agent Callus or Zer Leonis, um, who uh, I was involved in creating. I mean, obviously, I can't draw anything, period, like stick figures. I don't do well, but uh, so I had nothing to do with the art, but um, I definitely was involved in the creation of those uh, characters that came after the Inquisitor and the original six crew members. But those were all there before I came aboard. Great characters, but I can't take a lot of credit for them. Yeah, Star Wars Kanan I'm writing. It's uh, I, I, I should say I'm writing the first five issues, the first arc, um, which comes out in April. Yeah, back there. Uh, 
Um, no, my process is pretty much the same for everything. Um, I, uh, if we're talking about script writing, um, I start out with a big bulletin board, biggest bulletin board I can find at the moment, the show I'm working on now, and I can't say what it is, unfortunately, I'd love to. Um, but uh, the show I'm working on now, we've got two bulletin boards put flush against each other, so it's sort of like one. And uh, so each bulletin board is eight feet tall by four feet wide, so I've basically got an eight foot by eight foot square. Um, I get a lot of three by five index cards of various colors, and um, I put every little, every character, every little idea, whether it's a line of dialogue or a scene or um, just something, and I put that on a card, and we begin to move the cards around until we've got the story. It's very low-tech. I'm a low-tech guy. I'm borderline Luddite, um, and uh, we just do that until we've got the stories, and I like to uh, break entire seasons at a time. I don't sort of do an episode and say, well, we'll figure out what's coming later, you know. I want to make sure the whole season works before we start writing a single script. Um, so once the bulletin board is up, basically transcribe that onto a document. Um, we turn those, say, 13 episodes or 26 episodes, however many there are for the season, into premises and try to get all the premises approved basically at once. Then we have writers' meetings where we pull in um, myself and then usually... If there's a staff writer, great. If, if not, um, you know, we're pulling in three or four freelancers, um, and we talk through every episode. Everyone talks together about every episode, um, and uh, so that we get, um, I feel like I should be modeling. Uh, uh, so, yeah, well, I should work it more. But uh, we... Uh, talk through every episode, but everyone walks away with one. So, you know, like I said, we'll have a meeting where we'll take the first four episodes with four writers there, usually including myself, um, and each of us will take one of those four episodes and we'll write up an outline. Um, when I'm producing a show, all the outlines come to me. Uh, I'd usually do a pass on it just to clean it up, make sure it's in the style of the show, and we send it out to all the bosses to get notes, feedback. Um, they give us those notes, um, usually unless it's really catastrophic, like they had huge problems with it, we'll go right to script from there. And each writer will take the notes and use the outlines, which are very detailed. Um, I believe in doing all the hard work up front. So we try to break all the shows first on the board. Then when we're doing the writing of the outline, I say make that very detailed. I want the script to be the easiest part of the job. Um, so... You know, we'll have a 10-page outline for a 30-page script. You just take that outline, you format it as a script, and you're just filling in the dialogue at that point. Um, and that gives you time when you're doing the script to really get it right. Um, I favor very detailed scripts um, so that the artist has real, the storyboard artists, the designers, have real clarity about what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, they can make changes. Directors and storyboard artists often make changes off scripts. Um, sometimes I like the changes, sometimes I don't. Uh, but that's fine, as long as they understand what our intent was so that the change they're making is to the intent and not against the intent. Um, so the writer will turn in the script to me. Again, I'll probably do a pass on it, turn it in, get notes, then I'll probably do another pass. If all goes well, just one more pass, and then uh, we record it. And that's the script process. The novel, um, I, you know, being a novelist is, was new to me, so I use a very similar process. I, I got a giant bulletin board, uh, again, eight feet by four feet tall. Actually, yeah, I think it was eight feet, maybe six. No, I think it was eight feet tall. Um, and started putting up index cards. And then um, I ran out of space. So there was this big table in my office. So I filled, covered that with index cards. And then I ran out of space. So there was this pool table. So I started 
putting index cards on the felt um, and filled that almost literally. Like at the end, I think I might have had room for three more index cards by the time I was done. Um, and at the end, I had 693 index cards. And believe me, that sounds, it, it was very pretty. Uh, my office mates were very tolerant. Um, it occasionally was a pain with something that long. You know, you decide you needed to add a card near the beginning and moving all those cards one was a huge pain. Um, but then, like I said, I transcribed that into notes, um, you know, all those cards into notes so that when I sat down to write the book, I didn't have to figure out the story. I knew what the story was. I had that down. I knew what was coming and everything like that. Um, and I just was able to write and it was very freeing. And even then, as I was writing, there were a couple very minor characters. Uh, I'm talking about the second book now, Spirits of Ash and Foam. There were a couple of really minor characters in the book who turned out to be way more important than I initially realized. So I had to sort of figure out on the fly what their stories were going to be um, because they were telling me, no, we're not just characters who come in for a scene and walk away. We're uh, essential to this story. So I, it, and it was fun, but scary because I didn't, you know, again, I'm a guy who plans everything in advance, and suddenly I was sort of winging it on two characters who went from being very minor characters to important uh, supporting characters. So it was a very similar process, um, just on a much larger scale. Yeah. Yeah, I'm big on index cards. It, it's, it, to me, uh, and I'm not the only one in the business who uses that, although um, someone told me literally uh, on uh, Wednesday, you know, there's a computer program that can do that. It's the exact same thing. You know, you've got the cards, and, and, and it's like, a, you know, the interface is like a bulletin board, and I'm like, yeah, I've got a bulletin board, you know, and, and they're like, yeah, but you can do it on your computer. I'm like, but it's right here. And, and uh, to me, the tangibleness of it is very helpful. Yeah, I mean, and that's true too, because when I transcribe those cards, I'm, I'm always tweaking it a little as I go, and I think that's useful. Um, but I, again, what I like is when I walk into my office, I see the board with the cards, I don't have to pull up the computer if I need to get a sense of things. I mean, one thing we did, for example, on um, Young Justice, you know, we we had different color cards. So the, uh, the the blue cards were for the members of the team, and the red cards were for members of the Justice League, and the green cards were for the villains, and um, white cards were for things that we knew were happening off screen, but that we weren't going to show. So, um, you know, if we, if something that we would flash back to later that we didn't show, like secrets we were keeping, but things that we knew had to happen at a certain point. And if we also had purple cards and yellow cards. I forget. What, oh, the yellow cards were to fix things in time because we did Young Justice across six months each season. So, you know, if there was a holiday like Halloween, we were like, well, Halloween has to come here. Um, or if we were doing a character's birthday, okay, that has to come here because it's yellow. So, um, or not because it's yellow, it's yellow because it has to come here. It's in the ring. But uh, I forget what the purple cards were for. Um, but we had purple cards too. Uh, maybe those were, oh, uh, yeah, those were for our team's, uh, you know, real lives, their secret identity. So the purple cards would be like if you saw Connor and Megan in their high school or something like that, you know, kind of thing. Um, yeah. We didn't write any of it, but we... Uh, we have a very, Brandon and I, Brandon Vietti and I produce Young Justice, so we have a very clear idea of 
of the main thrust of what season three would be. No. No spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no one ever said that to me, but basically in any action show you're ever doing, almost every character at some point has a bad feeling about it. So it's not just Star Wars. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's over. The show's over. No, it's, it's not a political thing. It's just done. It didn't really. We did two seasons, 46 episodes, and ended the second season. It wasn't a cliffhanger. People keep telling me there was a cliffhanger. There was no cliffhanger. We, we, we intentionally put threads. We were hoping we'd get a third season, but um, we didn't. Um, but there was no cliffhanger. No one was left in danger or anything like that. Um, but no, we intentionally didn't tie up every loose end, and we teased a little in case we got a third season. But that's not the same thing as a cliffhanger. And it... Well, I wanted more, too, believe me. I mean, look, you guys were out of a show. I was out of a show and a job. So um, think about who wanted more and more. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, we did the time skip on purpose. We had always planned to do that um, because this was a show about growing up. It was one of the major themes. And, you know, we were doing the show more or less in real time. So the first season is six months. It goes from July 4th to December 31st, or I guess January 1st, since, you know, it hit midnight. They all kissed, remember? Uh, uh, and the second season went from January 1st to uh, July 4th, um, but there was just five years in between those two seasons, and the, and the reason for that is in six months, you just can't see a character grow up. You know, if we hadn't skipped ahead, you wouldn't have gotten Nightwing, you know, he still would have been Robin, you uh, uh, we wouldn't have been able to introduce uh, a lot of characters, I mean, uh, Beast Boy was a, uh, Gar Logan was eight years old when we introduced him, and he only got the blood transfusion that gave him his powers. So, you know, to get Beast Boy, we had to skip ahead five years. Um, so it allowed us to bring in a whole new group of characters and create these mysteries about what happened during the five-year jump. But the key, most important thing was we needed uh, to show these characters getting older, growing up, and you couldn't do that over even a year. So we needed that time skip to, for the themes of the series. Uh, the character was originally named Elisa Chavez, um, and we auditioned a number of people, and then Sally Richardson, who is African American, uh, mostly, but also Native American, um, uh, just got the part. She was fantastic, but she wasn't Hispanic, so it didn't make a lot of sense to to leave her Chavez, so we changed her name to Maza. We gave her a Native American father and an African American mother. Um, diversity is very important to me. Um, and it also thematically really worked with that show because Elisa was in a interspecies relationship, so it, it made for her to be open to that. It was nice that her parents had had an interracial relationship that worked and they were still married, you know, after with three adult children, so um, there was a nice sort of 
symmetry to that that we like. Plus, we got great stories out of her father's uh, Native American uh, heritage and her mother's African American heritage. And so it really was terrific. And plus, look, we got Sally Richardson, uh, who was amazing in the role. So it was a win-win for everybody. But we used the Chavez name, became Elisa's boss, Maria Chavez, um, and uh, cast the amazing Rachel Ticketon to play Maria. So um, Rachel had auditioned for Elisa, but sounded a little too old, a little more like the boss, a little less like the young detective. And so Rachel was great, but wasn't quite right for Elisa, but was perfect for Maria. Yeah. When I've been what? <laughs> Your question is sort of whelming, right? now, so, uh, yeah. I don't illustrate anything. I can't draw. I'm a writer. No, I'm not. I, uh, I'd love to do live action. I really would. Uh, but, uh, I've been sort of typecast as an animation writer. Uh, every time I've tried to get a job in live action, they're like, oh, well, you do cartoons. And uh, so I haven't been able to get any work in live action, which I'd love for no other reason than it pays a lot, lot more. Um, and let's be honest, I've got one kid in college and a senior in high school who's about to go to college. I got a mortgage. I'd love to get paid a lot, lot more. Otherwise, I love animation. I mean, I love work producing and writing for animation. It's not like I think of animation as a lesser industry or medium to be in. I'm perfectly happy doing animation on every level except monetarily. <laughs> uh, uh, but I'd love to do live action. You know, I tried really hard to get a meeting with the folks back before you, it even aired with the folks doing Arrow, and I just couldn't even get my foot in the door. So, uh, you know, which is a bummer because it would have been a lot of fun to work on that show. I've, I've, you know, I wrote the DC Showcase animated Green Arrow short. And I wrote Green Arrow in uh, um, Young Justice. And Black Canary is literally my favorite DC character ever. Um, and I wrote a Black Canary miniseries for DC back in the 80s that never got printed, but still I wrote it. Um, and uh, I've written both those characters in comics, and, but I couldn't couldn't get in. So, yeah, it's not wise for me to comment on that. Uh, other questions? Back there. Okay, I answered that question right at the beginning of the session. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I mean, what I will say is I got the first step into the business was in comics. Um, and uh, I haven't told this story, so I guess I can tell this. Um, I was a sophomore in college, um, and Marvel announced a new talent search. This is a long, long time ago. We're talking like 1982. Most of you probably weren't born. Uh, um, and uh, it occurred to me that they would be flooded with submissions. But it also occurred to me that DC would probably, once Marvel announced theirs, DC would probably announce a new talent search also. So instead of prepping Marvel submissions, I used the Marvel guidelines to prep DC submissions. And um, sure enough, like a month later, uh, DC announced their own new talent search, and I instantly sent off my materials to them. And that worked on one level. Um, years later, when I was working on staff at DC, I found the old logbook where they logged in all those submissions. And I was literally the second name on the list. So they logged me in, logged in my submissions, and then lost them. Um, so instead, and they had all my contact information. 
but they couldn't find the actual submissions. So instead of admitting that and sort of contacting me and saying, hey, look, we really apologize, but we've lost track of your submission. Could you resend it? They had two packets that they sent out, one for artists and one for writers. And about 70% of the, 70, 75% of the submissions they received were from artists. So they figured, odds are this guy was an artist. So they sent me the submission pack for artists, and I was outraged. It was very clear to me what had happened. And I was outraged in the way that only a 19-year-old can be outraged. Um, so I sent off this really angry letter to Dick Giordano, who was head of executive editor of, vice president executive editor of DC Comics at the time. Also an amazing talent, great guy, amazing talent, phenomenal inker, great penciler himself. Um, but it was this angry letter about how I was a professional, which of course I wasn't, but um, at least not yet. Um, and of course I kept copies of everything. If you couldn't find my submission, you could have just uh, asked me for copies. And in fact, I had, kept, I had, I was smart enough to have kept copies, but um, uh, so I wrote off this letter and I figured, well, that's that, you know. Um, and then, you know, I'm in my dorm room and the phone rings. You got to keep in mind, this is a long time ago. There were no cell phones. There were no cell Forget the smartphones. There were no cell phones. Um, so I uh, used, so we had a landline. Do you guys know what a landline is? All right. Some of you have heard of that. Yeah. So my roommate answered the phone, and he was not a comic book geek at all. So he answered the phone, and he turns to me and goes, some guy named Dick Giordano wants to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I told my friends about this, and so I thought one of them was calling, and it, it, this was like a bullshit crank call kind of thing. Um, so I get on the phone, and I'm like, hi. You know, like, with, you know, and he's like, hello, this is Dick. And I'm thinking, I don't know. Which of my friends is doing this voice? Because it sounds like, you know, a 50-year-old guy. And and, uh, and it became clear to me relatively quickly that this was Dick Giordano, so I tried not to hyperventilate because um, I was a huge fan of his. And, and he would gotten my letter, and um, he was impressed with the letter. Like, he still, no one had read any of my stuff. They lost that. Again, years later, I found it at the bottom of a file cabinet. Like when I was working on staff at DC, I was going through some file cabinet. I actually found my old submissions. You know how file cabinets, you have those file hanging folders? Mine had fallen down underneath those hanging folders. So I had been emptying out this cabinet, and there mine was like lying flat on the bottom of the drawer, you know. But no one had read my stuff, but he liked my letter. He thought it was well-written or amusing or something. I don't know. But he's like, so, yeah, you know, I'd love to talk to you. When are you coming to New York? And I went to college at Stanford University in Northern California. Um, and, um, and it was like, you know, uh, January, February. Um, I guess it was 1983. Yeah, 1983. Um, and... Uh, my sophomore year, and so I'm like, oh, well, actually, I'm going to be in New York over my spring break in March, so he's like, great, so we made an appointment, and whatever, and I hung up the phone, and I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> the first thing I had to do was figure out how the hell I was going to get to New York in March, because I had obviously no plans to go to New York, um, so I, I had a cousin who lived in Manhattan, who was willing to let me stay on her couch, and my dad had some frequent flyer miles, that he was willing to let me use to fly to New York. I had no money, you know. Um, and I get to New York, um, and I'm staying with my cousin, and the next day it is pouring rain, I mean torrential rain. Um, and um, my cousin's like, okay, let me tell you, how to use the subway to get there because she was going off to work. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to risk using the subway. I'm afraid I get lost. I'm just going to take a cab. And she's like, you're going to get a cab in Manhattan in the rain. I'm like, yeah, I think that's best. And she's like, good luck with that. And she leaves. So um, I dress up. I, I'm thinking this is like a job interview. So, by the way, this is fancy for me normally because it's got a collar. Um, 
I spent my whole life dressed like a 14-year-old, uh, but I wore a suit and tie because I thought this is a job interview. I had no idea that comic book people dress like me anyway. Um, so I wore a suit and tie. I go outside. I've got an umbrella. Almost instantly the wind, you know, folds the umbrella backwards. Um, I step down. It's like right out of Groundhog Day. I step down into this huge pothole that's full of water. So one foot is like completely soaked up to my ankle. Um, within seconds, I'm like a drowned rat. It takes, of course, forever to find a cab, though miraculously, it's, I do manage to get one later. My cousin was like, you actually got a cab? I'm like, yeah, it took me, a, I, it took me like a half hour to get a cab. And she's like, you got a cab in the rain in a half hour? She was like stunned that I managed to do this. So I get to their offices, which back then were at a, the address was 666 Fifth Avenue. Think about that for a second. Yeah, 666 Fifth Avenue is a little intimidating. But I went up there, gave my name at the reception, sat down. There was a guy reading the paper next to me, and I'm nervous as hell. And then finally I start thinking, like, uh, looking, glancing over at this guy. And I'm like, man, he's been reading the same page for, like, ever. And then I look at the paper. It's the Daily Planet. And I realize it's not a guy. It's Clark Kent. It's a manic. I mean, it's a statue of Clark Kent um, in the lobby, sitting there reading the Daily Planet. Um, so I go in for this meeting, and I don't know, Dick. I don't know if he took pity on me or what, but we kind of hit it off, and he introduced me to a bunch of editors, and I started writing freelance for them. I wrote a ton of stuff, like the Black Canary miniseries I mentioned that never got published. And it was really cool. I was getting paid, but nothing I was doing was seeing print. And I moved there over the summer um, and uh, just on rent. I lost so much money that first summer. Um, and then I moved there the second summer, which was between my, uh, at that point, between my junior and senior year. And uh, I broke even. Like, I didn't make any money, but at least I didn't, I didn't break even if you count that first summer, but I broke even that summer. Um, and I went to Dick at the end of the summer. I said, look, I got one more year of college, and I need to know, am I, am I any good? Because nothing I've done has been published. And, and there were reasons for it. Like, I wrote a Black Canary miniseries, and then Mike Grell decided to do Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters, and, and he was, wanted to use Black Canary. So it was like Greg Weissman, Mike Grell. I think we're going to go with Mike Grell. So my whole series got canceled. There were all sorts of reasons, but I said, look, if I'm you just got to be honest with me, if I'm no good at this, tell me and I'll go find something else to do. But if I'm, you know, I don't mind sticking it out. I don't mind toughing it out. If you think I've got potential, he's like, no, definitely he offered me a job as a associate editor. Um, after I graduated. So I graduated um, and all my friends senior year, you know, they're looking for jobs and they're interviewing and I'm not, I got a job already waiting for me until I graduate and I go down to San Diego Comic-Con, at which point Dick tells me, yeah, I'm really sorry. There's a hiring freeze. I can't hire you. So I'm like, oh, that's not good. Um, so I got a job in LA, which is where I'm from, uh, just working at a bookstore to just earn some money. Cause I said, all right, I'm going to move to New York anyway. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to keep freelancing comic books and hope that something happens. And literally I, you know, I was spending the summer in LA to just get a little bit of money, uh, in my pocket before I moved to New York. Um, and, uh, I think I was moving there like October 1st or something like that. And literally, like, September 28th, I get a call from Dick saying, hey, I've got a, the hiring freeze is still on, so I can't hire you as an associate editor. But um, the guy who was our editorial assistant just left. Um, and I'm allowed to fill positions that are empty. I can't take new people on, but I can fill holes. 
So would you, he says, it's not the same. Would you take that? I'm like, well, associate editor, editorial assistant, what's the difference? And of course, the editorial system is basically Xerox, where I wouldn't actually be editing. I'd be Xeroxing stuff for people and sending things out FedEx and DHL because we didn't have the internet. Um, and uh, I said, sure. So, I, you know, it was better than working at McDonald's. So I took that job and uh, within six months, I was promoted to assistant editor. And then six months after that, I was promoted to associate editor, which was the job that I originally was supposed to get. And, uh, uh, and then six months or a year after that, I left to go back to graduate school. But that's how I got into the business. And that helped me along the way, obviously. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I I spent two years at graduate school. I studied uh, playwriting. Um, I did a little bit of uh, fiction writing, a um, little bit of screenwriting, but my emphasis was in playwriting. Wrote a play. We produced it. Uh, came out pretty good. Um, and, you know, it just was, I think all that helped me with my craft a lot, um, but mostly what I did during that time is what helped, is I um, went on a, I talked to a lot of people throughout the, the Hollywood industry, throughout the business, and I went on what I called informational interviews as opposed to job interviews. I was able to get in through a lot of doors by saying, I'm not looking for a job. I just want to find out what it is you do because I want to figure out what it is I want to do. And you'd be amazed at how many people who would never let you in if you were saying, I want a job, were willing to let me in on that basis because they get to talk about themselves for an hour. And they and, you, and a lot of people in Hollywood like to talk about themselves. Not me. I never talk about myself. You can tell, right? Uh, but, no, a lot of people love to talk about themselves, so... I went in and met with a lot of different people on that basis, and I was able to say, no, I don't need a job. I, in fact, I couldn't take a job if you offered me one because I was actually, uh, as part of my scholarship, I was teaching freshman English at USC while I was going to school there, and I was under contract to do that, so I, I couldn't leave if, even if they, I wanted to. Um, and so they offered, I, they let me just listen. And, you know, I talked, but, I, you know, I met this guy, Gary Kreisel, and we kind of hit it off, and he really liked my resume because on the one hand, um, I had this great liberal arts education, I studied Shakespeare in Oxford, uh, you know, I uh, got a bachelor's degree from Stanford University in English with an emphasis in fiction writing, I was at USC with an emphasis in playwriting, so I had this sort of highfalutin educational resume, and then this really lowbrow uh professional resume as a comic book writer, and he liked that combination because what he knew that I didn't was that he was starting up an animation division at Walt Disney Television. Because uh, his job at the time, when I came in to meet with him, he was head of all of Walt Disney Television. But he was starting up this television animation division, and he thought I was perfect for that. And one, because he was tired of only hearing from people whose entire knowledge of film and literature was from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas movies. Um, so he was glad that I knew the classics and I was familiar with all that stuff. Um, but he also knew that I wasn't going to look down at doing animation because I was in comic books, which from everyone's point of view was an even lower form of life. So um, from his point of view, he was thinking, well, animation, that'll be a step up for this guy. In any case, financially it was, because the animation pays more than comics, and uh, just like live action pays more than animation. But uh, um, So, again, I had another year of school, but I knew that we had kind of hit it off. So of all the guys I talked to during that period, he was the one I kept sort of calling back. I didn't call back a lot, because I figured that would get on his nerves. Um, but, I, like, once a month I'd call. I never talked to him. I talked to his secretary, a woman named Jerry. And 
she and I just sort of developed a kind of rapport. She always felt just a little bit guilty that he hadn't called me back. So she'd be like, yeah, you're on his phone list. He's just been really busy. I said, hey. And I kept it really light. I'm like, hey, it's no big deal. Just thought I'd check in kind of thing. And um, so then, you know, as the year started to end, it got to like May. I called her again. And she's like, oh, yeah, he hasn't called you. I'm really sorry. You're on his phone list. I'm like, hey, it's no big deal. It's just, you know, I'm actually graduating now. And I would really like to talk to him. And. And she's like, I'm going to make sure you get to talk to him now. And she did. So I came in again, met with him again. He remembered who I was. And he was like, oh, yeah, I like this kid. So he uh, uh, had me meet with the guy at TV Animation. Um, I thought that meeting with this guy's name was Bruce Cranston, who later became one of my best friends, um, went really well. Bruce told me later, no, you were awful in that interview. Um, I'm like, if I was so awful, why'd you hire me? He was like, because Gary really liked you. And I just... It was easier to hire you than to not hire you, you know. Um, but the thing is, I got to TV animation, and I was there four days when Bruce uh, had to take a business trip to Europe that was supposed to last two weeks and ended up lasting six months. Um, and so I uh, wound up being the guy who um, – ran the development department on four days worth of experience um, for six months while he was gone. And he came back, and again, Bruce was really cool. A lot of guys would come back from that and be thinking, oh, this guy's trying to take my job or something like that, and, you know, put me back in my place and have me back just doing the assistant stuff. Um, but uh, he went to Gary and said, you know, Greg's been running this. we got to promote this guy. And so they promoted me. And uh, the rest is history, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I've been blessed to work on some really great properties. Uh, Spider-Man, of course. Star Wars, of course. Uh, the entire DC Universe and Young Justice. And I love that stuff. I'm working on a show now that's based on an existing property, which is a lot of fun. Um, and it's great. I mean, there's nothing quite like uh, creating something that's your own, like I did with Gargoyles, like I've done with my books, Reign of the Ghosts. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and I guess if I were adapting properties I thought sucked, that would be a bummer. But so far I haven't had to do that. You know, I've been working on – I love Spider-Man. You know, I love Star Wars, so working on those is a gift as far as I'm concerned. Oh, well, there's, like, fan pressure, you know. I mean, you know, it's very intimidating. Um, Spider-Man was a little intimidating. Young Justice was probably a little more intimidating. Star Wars was ridiculously intimidating. I mean, you know, I got hate mail once it was announced we were doing Rebels because, from Clone Wars fans. And I'm like, you do understand that I'm not the guy who canceled Clone Wars, right? You know, I mean, that wasn't me. So, and I also don't have the power to bring it back, you know. So, um, and, but they were furious. Um, and some of them are still furious. I, mean, I think most of them have started to watch Rebels and realize it's a pretty great show. And uh, I'm proud of it anyway. And, um and a lot of those Clone Wars fans have sort of come around and go, okay, well, this is fun, too. I still am mad about Clone Wars, but this is fun, too. But th there are still people who, like, tweet me and going, there's no way I'd ever watch your show, man, because they canceled Clone Wars. I'm like, okay, but you understand, you're missing out, you know. You're, you're cheating yourself out of more great Star Wars stuff by refusing to do this. It's not like you're hurting me. Um, it's certainly not like you're hurting Disney. Um, you're just hurting yourself, you know, so, uh, yeah, we've got time for that. one more, yeah. There are no goofy questions, just goofy answers. Um, Goliath was um, named by uh, just the inhabitants of the castle because um, gargoyles don't have names naturally, but the humans felt they needed some name for him. So they named him Goliath because he was this big, huge gargoyle. But they also were aware, Goliath wasn't, but they were aware of the, uh, of the fact that they were, in essence, naming him after a villain from the Bible. 
Um, you know, we don't think about that much, particularly in Gargoyle's terms, because Goliath is the big hero. But the fact of the matter is, in the Bible, Goliath is the villain. He's the big villain that David takes down. So, um, that's, uh, in show, that's how Goliath got his name. So, um, what do I get? Five minutes, or is there someone coming in next? Oh, well, we can go forever. Um, I'm not giving spoilers, dude, so I'm not going to do that. Well, hold on. Let me, I, I just want to make sure I get this in. Um, I have a booth down in the 900 row. I, I, if they're booth numbers, I haven't seen them. But, um, but uh, there's a big banner with my name on it and pictures of Young Justice and Spider-Man and Star Wars Rebels up there, so it's not that hard to find it. Um, and I'll, I'm there periodically throughout the weekend. Um, I'm going to pimp here for a second, so I have patience with me. But um, I've got my two novels, Reign of the Ghosts, Spirits of Ash and Foam. Um, I'm so, I don't take credit cards, but I sell them for $10 cash each. Um, if you buy both, uh, that is for $20, you get free the development artwork for Reign of the Ghosts that um, what we tried to sell it as an animated series. Um, I'm also selling animation scripts for $20 cash from shows like Young Justice, Spectacular Spider-Man, Witch, Starship Troopers, The Batman, uh, Batman Brave and the Bold, Men in Black, plus a couple goofy radio plays, uh, Young Justice meets Gargoyles meets Spider-Man, that we did at conventions uh, past. Um, so... Uh, if you're interested in any of that stuff, you can get that there. Uh, autographs are free. I'll sign anything that you buy from me, obviously, but also anything that you bring that you've got, I'll sign for free. Photographs are free. But um, I would like to, you know, sell these books. I'm really proud of these novels. If you like the shows I've done, any of them, um, I guarantee you you're going to like these books, particularly Gargoyles, because uh, Reign of the Ghost was originally the first thing I developed after I finished working on Gargoyles. It's full of mythology. It's full of um, legends translated into a modern context. Um, it's got great characters, um, I, and it's a great setting, these Caribbean islands off the Bermuda Triangle. So I really recommend them highly. I realize I'm biased, but I believe in them a lot, and uh, uh, I'd love for more people to, to be able to look at them. All right, so we've got time. I'm trying to think where my next, what my next thing is. Right, so, uh, you know, I need to get some food at some point today, but I definitely got time, so if people still have questions, we'll keep going for a little while. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, we had great executives. We didn't have a network. We were syndication show. That helped. Um, also, there was a lot of turmoil at the Walt Disney Company when I was doing Gargoyles. Um, because I had been an executive, um, I was given a little more rope to hang myself with than most shows were given. I, I often compare it to being in a lunatic asylum where they have trustees they're still inmates, they're still patients, they're still crazy, but they give them batons to keep the other patients in line. So I've often referred to myself as the lunatic most trusted in those days. Um, I do, uh, there were a couple things. One, um, Frank Parr and I produced the show together, and I do remember uh, our boss, Gary Kreisel, took us to lunch one day uh, and, and sat us down at, at the lunch and and he was very apologetic. He said, look, I have not, I've been so busy with other things, I have not had any time to focus on gargoyles. So tell me what's going on in the show. Talk to me about it. And so we started telling about the show. We got to the part where he said, oh, and um, Fox and Xanatos are getting married and having a baby. And he's like, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. It's like, they're the bad guys. We can't have the bad guys have kids, you know. And I was like, um, well, we already did it. And there's this long pause where Frank and I have this nightmare vision of him making us rip up 
the whole season and, and redo it all and kind of think it finally, I don't know. If, I don't know if he was just too exhausted or whatever, but Gary said, all right, fine, but don't dwell on it. I don't know what that meant. So we were like, oh, yeah, great. We won't dwell on it, you know, kind of thing. Um, and the only other time is we had an idea for a story that would have been a two-parter where um, uh, the Weird Sisters trapped Macbeth in the gargoyles in a production of Macbeth, except it was really happening. So that um, they, uh, you know, Macbeth is a tragedy where nearly everybody dies in it. So um, it was would have been given us a chance to actually do some Shakespeare on the show, not just use characters from Shakespeare, but actually do the Shakespeare play, but with this sort of real crisis, because, you know, they've got to break the spell before they all start dying off. Um, and uh, Gary said, uh, my immediate boss on the show was a guy named Jay Facuto, who was great, but he's like, I don't know about this one. Um, the, re the actual language of Shakespeare and everything, I'm not sure. And he, he didn't say no, but he felt like he had to take it to his boss, which was Bruce Cranston, the guy I mentioned earlier. And Bruce was like, yeah, I don't know about this. So he took it to Gary. And Gary was like, oh, I don't know about this. And I was trying to talk him into it. And he said, all right, look, do it as one episode. You know, that, you know, one out of the 65, we can let you do your weird thing you want to do, you know. But I don't want to do it as a big two-parter. And then, so he didn't say no, but I said no, because I didn't think, I, I mean, it was one thing to cut Macbeth down to, in essence, 44 minutes. That would have been hard enough. But cutting it down to 22 minutes with the whole sort of, you know, other story about them being trapped in spell, I thought there's no way we could do justice to that story in uh, one 22-minute episode. So I, uh, I'm i the one who actually killed it. Uh, but I guess you could say they thought that one was maybe pushing it for our audience. But everything else they just let us do. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I've exhausted you. Yeah. Um, probably, I mean, I really do, I'm really fond of uh, every episode of the first two seasons, but um, if I had to just pick one episode, that eliminates the multi-parters, because that's more than one, even though those were prior stars. So if I only could pick one, it was probably the mirror. Um, which is the episode where we introduced Puck and all the gargoyles were transformed into humans, vice versa. And to me, that episode really is working on all cylinders. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of great humor in it. The animation itself is gorgeous. Great action, great drama, great pathos. It sort of really puts a focus on the sort of tragic love affair of Goliath and Elisa. At least it was tragic at that stage. Um, so you've got romance and action and comedy and all sorts of stuff. That, to me, was Gargoyles um, at its, you know, really firing on all cylinders. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, it was my decision, but um, I think uh, in the comics, you know, this was just before New 52, they relaunched Justice League, and the idea of having the Hall of Justice as a uh, place that, out in the open, that people could see, and that it secretly teleported you up to the Watchtower, that came from the comics. And I'm trying to remember, um, I think it was, I want to say Brad Meltzer wrote that, so I think I got the idea from, from Brad Meltzer. I'm not 100% sure, but I didn't come up with the idea. Um, I, uh, I got it from somewhere. I, it might have been... Was the Hall of Justice in Super Friends, was that in Metropolis? I, I always felt like it was in Washington, D.C. It didn't feel like it was Metropolis or Gotham or, you know, it, it, so it always seemed to me like it was Washington, D.C., so that felt right to me in any case. And But I think Brad Meltzer put it in Washington, D.C., I'm, I'm pretty sure. It was right before the Lightning Saga, but when he rebooted Justice League and, and yeah, something like that. So it was right in that era, um, 
right before that, before Black Canary became leader, it was Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman looking at a lot of photos on the table as to who's going to, who they're going to choose to to reconstitute the Justice League. And then they wound up going on some adventure and saying, all right, screw the photos. We'll just take the people who are here right now. Um, and and uh, so that's uh, what they did. Um, we didn't like the photo idea so much, but... Uh, but I did like that whole idea of there being a sort of public place for the Hall of Justice where tourists could come in and kind of thing. But what they didn't know, is, and not even our team knew initially, was that there were really just teleporters there. And the real Justice League meeting place was the Watchtower, which was a satellite up in space. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Please stop my, by my booth, even if you don't want to buy something at some point during the weekend. I'm um, doing a bunch of other panels, but thanks a lot. Bye.